rule. Um, so let me know throughout uh, any questions you've got. Um, it's me personally, to the group whole, um, and I'll sort of harvest those as it were. Um, the plan is for Aggie to speak to some slides for around about 15 minutes, something like that. Um, and then uh, we'll have a conversation oh, after. OK, so without further ado, uh, recordings hit. We'll stop that shortly and Aggie over to you. Welcome and thank you for doing this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so can I just ask if everyone, if, when you're not speaking, if you can put your microphones on mute, please. If that's OK, I just had a couple of thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my slides and then we will get going. So first of all, thank you very much for having me, um, Richard. I am so pleased and thrilled to be here as part of the Experts at Work series. Um, and as um, Richard has said, we're going to talk today about how to have impactful conversations about race. So given the current laser like focus there is at the moment in society about race and um, uh, injustices across the globe, um, this seems like a very timely conversation to have. And also Richard and I had a really good chat around what we think will be helpful for our uh, people professionals and this came up as the um, most requested subject. So over the next uh, 20 minutes or so, I'm going to say, Richard, over the next 20 minutes or so, I'm going to talk you through uh, the subject in three key chunks. Uh, so the first one will be before you begin the conversation. Um, so as we have all heard, I'm sure many, many, many times, um, the preparation you do before any event or any undertaking will set you up for success or not, um, I guess. So um, the the chunk of the conversation I'm going to have with you today will be mainly around what to think about before you begin. And the key areas are why talk about race? So why is it important and why should we not shy away from it? Why is it hard? Because it is hard, it is difficult and we completely understand that. So we'll talk a bit about why that is. And then we'll talk about the considerations you should take and I invite you to take before you start talking about race. We'll then move on to leading the conversation. So what does having the actual conversation look like? How do you create that safe space um, so that people feel able and willing to share um, very personal and sometimes very painful truths? Um, and then also what sort of topics um, should you discuss? And then we'll talk about after the conversation. So what does communication look like? What do you need to think about? And then also taking action. So launching into why, you know, why do we need to talk about race? Um, so in the wake of the murder of uh, George Floyd, we have all spoken about race over the last few months, probably much, much more than we have in our entire lives. Um, and the reason uh, for that is because, um, A, I guess we had the pandemic, so a lot of people were at home and they were able to engage a lot more in what was happening in the world. Equally, there has been a sense, a bigger sense of humanity, um, I guess, because of the pandemic as well. We had, you know, one enemy, um, which I guess is the pandemic, um, and then that then uh, translated to uh, one enemy, which was racism. And we saw people coming out and marching, protesting in a way that I certainly haven't seen in my lifetime. So as you can expect, you know, those conversations around race have been happening amongst friendship groups, um, amongst families at dinner tables, um, even in schools. I know a lot of schools have started talking about race and what that what does that look like? Um, and with those conversations, there is a lot of uh, confusion. There is a lot of disbelief. There's a lot of pain, hurt, uh, fear um, and sometimes guilt as well. Um, and as happens with anything in society that is significant, those conversations do make their way to their workplace. And, you know, while we don't gather around the water cooler in quite the same way um, as we would have done before, people have started talking about it. Um, I mean, at the beginning of the call, we talked about people started to come back to work, um, but equally teams are meeting on meetings like this um, and they are meeting virtually and people are starting to ask questions, starting to dip their toe um, in the water around this conversation. And as I've said before, you know, this this conversation comes with a lot of confusion. People don't necessarily know how to have the conversation. Uh, there is disbelief, um, there is um, anger, and also there is a lot of discomfort. So it's really, really important that A, the conversation's had, but equally uh, that the conversation is managed um, in a way that allows for expression, learning, um, and also a lot of uh, vulnerability. 
Another reason um, that we need to have the conversation is that um, many organisations haven't done this as yet and their people are feeling this. They're feeling that people, uh, their organisations don't care. Um, I've been privileged to uh, take part and facilitate um, a number of safe, safe, safe space conversations, A, for um, leadership teams, but also for, for black employees and also mixed groups of employees as well. Um, and one of the first things that employees um, say in these conversations is, you know, I'm so glad we're speaking because I actually thought the business didn't care. Uh, I'm so glad we're talking about this um, really traumatic event um, because previously I thought that the business didn't care at all. Um, so it's likely that if the conversations haven't started yet in your organization, there may be some, maybe many of your employees who are feeling like you don't care. Now, I don't necessarily think that's the case. I don't think that um, the majority of people don't care. I just think it's a very difficult conversation. Um, and now I'm going to sort of move on to talk about why it's hard. And I'm sure some of these things will, will ring uh, true for you as well. Uh, so why is this conversation so hard? Um, so first of all, you know, as a society, um, we have had a very, very long history with race, um, you know, from the enslavement of people to the Brixton rights in the UK to many other things. The conversation tends to be teamed with pain, anger, um, discrimination, you know, subjects that we don't really find that easy to talk about. Also, how we uh, how we've come to know racism um, and where it is now is quite different. So, if we look at the top of this pyramid, this is what I guess the term racism used to mean. Certainly before, um, let's say, the twenty fifth of May. For us, when we talked about racism, many people thought about you know potentially um, genocide um, and Hitler, etc or they thought about you know, murder, really horrible, violent things. Um, they may have thought about uh, maybe people having signs saying, go back home. So very overt um, dis uh, displays of racism. What we've come to know, or what most of us have come to know over the last few months is that racism has many forms. Um, and what we see now is not as easy to pinpoint necessarily. It's not as easy to call out and say that is racism. So you have um, economic discrimination, you have maybe some name calling. And then there are some things that maybe, you know, some of us have partaken in such as, you know, jokes or things that we think don't necessarily hurt. Um, but the fact is that they do and they do have an impact. Um, so again, that's why it's quite difficult to talk about racism. A lot of people thought that we're in a post-racial, post-racism society. However, we've come to understand more recently that it does take on many forms. And then when it comes to the other, uh, the actual conversation, nobody really wants to sort of uh, talk about it. Um, and there are many reasons for that. So for white people um, who haven't really had to think about race or their own race, um, there, there are there are some conversations around. You know, how can I possibly be part of the problem? You know, I have good values. I want to do good. I want to do no harm. So how is it that I'm now being told that I'm part of the problem? Um, I haven't asked for this. So yes, I might have privilege, and yes, the system might might the system might work better for me. But this isn't something that I've asked for. So how can I be held accountable? What if I say the wrong thing? Um, I don't want to upset anyone. And then that piece, um, like the previous slide, really, is it really that bad? I don't see, you know, horrible um, racist signs in places. I don't hear people saying horrible things. Is it really that bad? And then what if I offend someone? You know, most of us don't want to do harm. So, you know, it can be quite difficult to have the conversation. And then also the big piece, I feel so vulnerable. Um, again, uh, I've also had the privilege of um, uh, conducting what I call inclusion coaching. It's coaching really, but with, it, with an inclusion lens. And there is a big feeling of vulnerability, a big feeling of feeling like people are pointing fingers. Um, so, you know, people feel very, very vulnerable. But it's also really, really important to understand that the conversation around race is also not easy for people of colour. Now, when I say people of colour, I mean black, Asian, um, any people that we might consider a ethnic minority in the UK. And a lot of the reasons are quite similar, actually, what you'll see in a second. So the first biggest one is that, you know, they, they, people feel they won't be believed. Um, so again, unless we're pointing at those very obvious, um, overt uh, examples of racism, uh, people may not recognise the, the minor, maybe minor, maybe less overt things as racism. 
um, this piece around playing the race card. Um, so it's interesting, Richard and I had a conversation about this term and the first time I'd ever heard it was actually in the workplace as an HR person uh, where another person was saying that somebody was playing the race card. Um, so again, that's a big fear and a reason why people don't necessarily speak up. People feel like it might impact their career and maybe their job in the, the current role they're in, so they're more reticent to talk about it. Um, and then there's also a piece around not also not wanting to do harm, so not wanting to shock people or upset people. So do I say it as it really is or do I sugarcoat it or do I make it OK and digestible for people to hear? Um, and then, as you saw in the last slide, exactly the same piece around what if I offend someone, you know, nobody wants to do that. And also that piece around feeling vulnerable. So, you know, different sides of the coin and different sides of the conversation, but a lot of the same feelings that lead to people not wanting to talk about it. And then also, if we uh, dial back a little bit to the um, hashtag me too, um, situation we had um, a couple of months, a couple of years ago, sorry. Um, if you look at some of those reasons why people don't want to talk about race, they're exactly the same reasons why people don't want to talk about uh, potentially um, issues around hashtag me too. Um, so yeah, worth, worth pointing out. And I think what I'll say in terms of all those things I've just spoken about is, you know, they're, they're, they are, there are very good and deep seated reasons why, you know, other organizations or individuals don't want to talk about race. Um, but what I, I found this quote, which I really quite liked, which is that growth is often uncomfortable, messy and full of feelings that you weren't expecting. And I think that's the important word to pick out of that is growth. Um, I believe that through talking um, about these issues, and I've certainly seen that through talking about race um, or even hashtag me too, which is not the subject today, but whatever form of discrimination, there is growth. Growth for everybody involved, so the individuals in the conversation, but also growth for the business, because the business gets to understand um, where it's maybe not meeting its commitments or maybe it's the, their intention isn't, um, isn't um, translating through to lived experience. And it also engenders more open conversations for the people taking part and their leaders and the rest of the business as well. So those are the reasons why I think we should we should definitely talk about it. So I'm now going to move on to talk about the considerations that I think organisations and people teams should take before they enter into the conversations. Like I said earlier, I'm going to spend a lot of my time here because I think the preparation you do beforehand will absolutely set you up uh, in good stead to have um, impactful and positive conversations. So the first piece is culture. So I think every people person should consider the culture of the organisation before entering into these conversations. And what I mean by that is if you have a culture that is very open, feedback flows back and forth very easily, you have those vulnerable conversations, um, it's is calls itself a learning organization and you know people are ready and willing and able to receive feedback that'll be a, lot, a, a much easier conversation for you to have and if you're in that space and you feel lucky enough to be in that space then i would suggest that you lean on whatever frameworks that we you usually use to have those conversations in the race conversation as well but if like most um, organizations and i'll say most organizations you know you haven't quite got to that place as yet um i would suggest that you consider um almost laying the groundwork first so introducing um concepts such as you know growth mindset um leaning on some training that maybe you've done before and reminding managers and reminding your people around uh, that training you've done in the past and if you haven't then maybe uh, sourcing some quick quick webinars around again that piece around growth mindset taking in feedback um i think that will absolutely help uh, um, your organization the next piece is connection to the organization it's really important that these conversations aren't almost just uh, they don't seem as though they're just landing for no real um reason um probably sounds like a bit, a bit of a silly thing to say but they need you need to connect the uh, conversation to your organization whether that's the inclusion strategy uh whether that's your values so most organizations have values around doing no harm 
values around supporting their their organizational family, uh, values around inclusion, etc. So, you know, always hook these conversations, I would suggest, to uh, your organization in some way. So an example may be one of our values is to treat everybody as a family member. Um, we have come to we've, we've come to be aware that you know there are some issues of racism in society. We want to ensure that our family is taken care of, you know, just something like that. Really, really crass example, but hopefully you know you know what I mean. Um, and then moving on to intention. Um, so again, set the intention for the conversations. Um, I think everybody taking part, whether it's your black employees, your people of color, your employees of color, your um, employees who um, are, you know, are, aren't any either of those groups, they need to understand the intention of the conversation. Is it that you just want to hear? Um, I would suggest that's a good starting point, but maybe that's not the end of it. Is it that you want to um, change the way you work because you realize that there's an issue? Um, or is it that you want some feedback to build into a strategy? So set the intention of the conversations. Um, and within that, which I might cover a little bit later, I'll say it now anyway, I can say it again, it's fine. Um, also within that, I would say that you need to be very clear um, about what you're going to do with the information and where it's going to go. So similarly to what we just described around sort of Chatham House rules um, and, um, you know, stating that uh, when you communicate about the, the conversations. So we want to understand how people feel, but we're not going to use that information outside of the room. We're going to talk about themes. We're not going to pinpoint to say, oh, Billy said he doesn't understand uh, racism. We're not doing any of that. So being clear about that as well. Then I'd say um, almost almost to the culture point is equip your managers as well before you start the conversations. And what I mean by that is, you know, um, have your uh, A managers ready to know that the conversations are happening, but equip them with um, where to go if questions are asked. So if somebody says, oh, I've just had a, a really um, good conversation about my experience uh, post George Floyd, I actually feel quite upset about it. I don't know what to do with the emotion. Make sure that managers are clear about what the next step is. So it could be either actually I can send you to HR and they can support you or the EAP is is, is available for you or actually let, let's talk about it um, because we have that coaching um, culture. So just make sure your managers know where to divert people if there is any sort of um, aftermath, I suppose, from the conversations. Um, communicate, um, and I can't say this enough really, so communicate uh, and communicate and communicate some more. Um, let your people know the conversations are happening, so let the whole business know the conversations are happening. Help them to understand why they're happening, so the previous slide around hooking it to the organisation, the previous slide around intention, um, and the previous slide around culture, just check my word, uh, around culture, so communicate that to them. And then also communicate what your plan is. So some of the organizations I'm working in, what they've done is they're speaking to the black employees first because they recognize that this is a specific issue that affects that employee group in a specific way. And the plan is to then open up the conversation to, to everybody so they can have that sort of sharing of experience, that understanding that help me understand conversation. So it's really important before you have the conversations, if you can, to communicate what that looks like. Because then what you then avoid is having people thinking, wait a minute, I've got things to say about this. Why are they not speaking to me? Or feeling as though they're left out of the conversation. And then the other bit is language. So I'm sure you've all come across uh, new words you haven't come across before, and new terms you haven't come across before. And I have got those on the next slide. So I'll explain some key terms which are very important to understand and to consider before the conversations. This is the last bit before, then we'll move on to the actual conversations in a second. Um, so Bain, um, I'm sure you have seen this uh, term being um, discussed and debated quite a lot over the last uh, few months. Now BAME is, is a, um, an acronym for Black, Asian, Minority, Ethnic, and it's usually used by government bodies to describe well, a group of people who aren't white, I suppose is probably the best way to put it. And for that reason, it has come across, um, under a lot of scrutiny. The reason behind that is because the experiences of uh, Black people versus Asian people versus other minority ethnics is very, very different. And people feel that that term just sort of conflates and hides, you know, real injustices. 
Um, and, you know, while some people have in the past used it to describe people, my suggestion would be it is better to just describe someone by their heritage. So if you're looking at me, call me a black woman. If you're calling, if you're looking at an Asian person, call them an Asian person. If you know that they're Indian, even better, you know, call them by, by where they're from rather than using that, that term. Um, then we have anti-racist uh, versus non-racist. Um, I will point you, rather than sort of taking time talking about it, I'll point you to a really, really good BBC uh, bite-sized video by John Amici, which explains that absolutely beautifully. Um, but essentially, um, anti-racist is being actively not racist. And um, an example that he he gives, I think, there's, yeah, the example he gives is if you're non-racist, somebody can tell a racist joke and you won't necessarily engage but you won't say anything. If you're anti-racist, you'll say that, that I don't find that funny, that's quite offensive and here's why. So it's that piece. White Privilege, another um, beautiful um, bite-sized video by BBC, which I'll invite you to have a look at as well. Just Google White Privilege BBC Bite Size and you'll see that as well. And the example that John Amici again gives in that is, you know, as an able-bodied person, so myself, I can go to the tube station, I can go to the rail station, I can walk, skip up the stairs, skip down the stairs. I don't even think about whether somebody in a wheelchair could, you know, could um, enter the train or anything like that. That for me would be able-bodied privilege if that makes any sense. I have lots of issues, loads of different things that go on, um, lots of hard, different hardships in life, but being uh, being not able-bodied is not one of those. And white privilege is, is the same, where somebody can go through life and they will suffer hardships, they will have letdowns, but none of those will be because of their race. So being somebody who's non-white just adds another layer. So you have all your normal everyday stuff, but then you also have racism on top of that as well. Um, and then for the white fragility piece, this speaks to uh, the reactions that sometimes people feel and experience when they talk about racism. So if we go back to that slide where we had the people of colour thoughts around not talking, uh, that piece around a not disbelieving people or uh, feeling defensive or potentially suggesting that the problem isn't really that bad. Um, and again, that's another term that I invite you to have a look at uh, just so you understand it as well. Um, and then the last piece is colorblind, which um, I think comes from a really beautiful intention, which is where people say, I don't see color, I see everybody exactly the same. And I think the intention is beautiful in that you want to see everybody exactly the same and treat them the same. But then when um, people suggest that they're colorblind, what they fail to understand is that someone's race is actually linked to their heritage, which is linked to their culture, which is a big part of who they are. So in saying you're colorblind, you could also be asserting that you don't see the person for who they are or you don't see the person for their, their fullness of person. Just like nobody would say I'm gender blind, I don't see that you're a woman, you know, that wouldn't really make sense. And um, colorblind is almost the same. So now moving on to the actual conversations themselves. So um, my first suggestion, um, and I'd urge you to do this, is to make the conversations uh, safe space conversations. Now there is quite a lot to that, but I'll take you through the key principles. So the key principles are strict confidentiality, as I'm sure you'd expect. Uh, people do share, and you know, like I said, I've been really pr privileged to take part in these, do share some very deep, painful um, experiences. Um, and also people who are white have also shared some really, really deep um, fears or deep confusions, et cetera. So it, you have to have strict confidentiality. Um, also, especially when you're having the open conversation with everybody in it, um, you have to acknowledge that everybody has different perspectives. There isn't a right answer. There isn't a right perspective. Everybody has different perspectives and we need to um, uh, respect that. Um, acknowledging discomfort and fear for everyone is really important. Um, it's really important that everyone knows this is not comfortable for anyone. So to approach the conversation with compassion and kindness. Um, I also invite everyone to suspend their judgment. So just listen, hear what's been said to you. Don't rush to judgment. Don't rush to answer. Just hear what's being said to you. It's also really important to pause. Uh, no one to pause for more learning and reflection. The conversations can get quite um, 
quite difficult and you can get to a place where you've got two people locking horns and when facilitating these conversations is really really important that you know how and when to pause uh, for reflection um, and then the last bit is to seek shared meaning um, in all the conversations i've certainly been part of there is always some shared value shared meaning that you can get to um, even if it's as simple as you know we all agree that the world should be just we all agree that the world should be fair you know let's almost focus on that um, sometimes then um, scale that back to the experience and then suggested topics to explore and I, I would suggest that these are handled very carefully and by someone who is skilled to do that um, and again it depends who's in the conversation but are things such as racial identity what does it mean to be the race that you are how has it um, impacted your life experience has do you think it's impacted your experience of the organization more often than not, people will say, yes, yes, it has. And they can sort of talk about how. Um, what do you think about your organization's response to the increased awareness of racial injustice? Um, sometimes good, sometimes not so good, but very often this is what we need to do going forward. Um, what are your views on inclusion in the organization? And then what suggestions do you have to improve inclusion? And it's amazing that, you know, again, in all of the conversations that I've been um, privileged to be part of, people always have really good ideas and really good thoughts around the future. What do we do going forward? How do we make this happen? Um, which for me certainly speaks to great engagement. And then lastly, after the conversation, so this is my last slide, but no, but one. Um, so after the conversations, communicate. So I've said communicate, I think, three or four times already, and I'll say this again. It's really, really important that everything you said you were going to do, everything you communicated about beforehand, you then communicate about after the conversations or even during, I would say, so in the middle of different conversations and you communicate your learnings. This is what we've learned. This is what we've come to realise. Here's what we're really proud of. Uh, but then also here's potentially where we have misstepped. And I think it's important to be that vulnerable as well and talk about where as an organization you might have taken a misstep. Um, and then ultimately this is what we're going to do going forward. Here's what you're going to see from us as an organization. And then here is how we'd like you to play a part in that as well. It's important that every individual knows what part they play in it. Um, and then the last one really is just to say, take, take action. Whatever it is you say you're going to do, please do that and update your employees as you go along. And then I'm going to go back to this uh, to this um, quote that we had um, a few slides ago around growth uh, being uncomfortable, messy and full of feelings. And I saw this picture, I thought it was awesome. Um, and, you know, and I think this is the journey that a lot of people do go on where they do start off quite confused and thinking, what does this all mean? You know, how am I part of this? What, what is this that we're talking about? I've never had to think about this in my 40, 50, maybe 30 years of life. Um, then as they start listening, they start sort of processing things and the cogs sort of start turning. Um, I'm sure it's not as easy as this, but you know that's you know that's what we'll aim for. Um, and then they get to a place of understanding and growth and learning, and actually let's figure this out together. So yes, so I would definitely encourage you to go ahead and do that. And um, I you know look forward to hearing you guys talk about how you've got to that last picture where you're thinking, yes, I get it, and let's grow together. And this is me. If anybody has any questions post our time together, I'm so sorry. I know that's much more than the 20 minutes I promised, um, but hopefully that was really helpful and it's giving you some food for thought.